if you guys want to come forward more and sit down. Um. Okay. Well, if you get tired, just come on up and sit down. <laughs> I want to thank you guys for having me here at Coastal Carolina. Um, the show is absolutely beautiful. Um, you guys have been a gracious uh, host to me, um, and I just want to thank you for that. Um, in preparing for a talk today, I bring with me a lot of excitement about uh, coming and talking to you guys in particular, um, because like yourselves, I studied at, um, at Messiah College, uh, like Jim had said, which is a, a liberal arts college where I received a BA in art. And that's a teaching university where, teaching college, where the emphasis is really on the student and, um, and also on not just learning the skills, the art skills that you need to learn, 
um, and one particular um, mode of working. But at a teaching school, we care about the whole entire person and development. And so that's why I take the liberal arts classes. So it's just really exciting talking to a group of students who made the same exact decision that I did in their undergraduate studies. And I'm thinking about what to talk to you guys today. Um, went back and forth a little bit about what I wanted to focus on. And I decided that I really wanted to um, talk to the, to the time we're in right now. It's the beginning of the school year. Um, who is a freshman here? Who's an art major? Excellent. Who's a non-art major then? Right, so we got a good crowd. Who's a senior and junior and upperclassman? Wow. OK, excellent. So we have a wide variety of folks here in a different uh, stage in the journey. And, and I thought it'd be more important, to, instead of just talking about the work itself, to talk about um, development of your artistic practice. Um, and, and, and what is really involved? And, and why do we come to the studio? Why did we choose to be in art class in the first place? So I'd like to propose that everyone comes to, everyone comes to art for similar reasons. We go to the gallery. Um, we, we've been to a museum before, and you see, a, you see a piece of artwork, and it speaks to you. It makes sense. You may not know anything about the artist, but it, it, it calls something out of you that you want to participate with and, and add to, and add to the field. So one of the persons who, um, oddly enough, were surrounded by non-representational work, but what really drew me into the arts was figurative artist. And so Alice Neal is one of those people. And also Gia Cometti. And I fell in love with these, these portraits of people and decided, if, if, well, if you'd asked me 13 years ago, what would I be standing up here and talking to you about? I'd say, well, of course, portraits. I'm going to be talking about my uh, portraitures of people. So how do we get there? How do we get to? Um, we come into the studio because something is called out to us, and we want to partake in this creative process. We want to be successful. Um, but what are the forces that are pushing against artists? And I, I started making a very, very long list of all the different things that, that are pushing against us when we're in the studio, or even trying to get into the studio. And um, I was able to distill the list down to two things, external pressures and internal pressures. And for those external pressures, there's, there's all this uh, weight on us today that um, we need to be successful. We need to have our stuff together. We need to know what we're talking about. Um, we need to be um, maybe perfect at times. And, and that's, a lot, that's a lot of pressure to take in a studio, um, the sense of needing to have it all figured out. And, and I guess an external and internal really do work together in that we, we start to embody those external pressures um, and, and make them our own, unfortunately. So I want to tell you a couple stories about um, how I push against some of those external internal pressures within the studio. And I'm going to start with you with my undergraduate work. Um, in my junior year um, at Messiah College, I had a professor. Um, it, was, it was my... Um, it was my first advanced coursework, so I had, I had done all the skill building courses and the foundations. And, and then I got to focus on anything I wanted to. And my professor asked me, what do you want to work on? And I was like, well, the figure, of course. This is what my work's about. And I, and I had works there that I had done in previous semesters that I valued, that um, uh, made sense. And she said, OK, so, so OK, well then, why do you like the figure? So I came up with some answers for him. Um, they were answers that he didn't like necessarily. Um, it had to do with, um, well, you know, I like rendering the form. Um, I like the fact that I can uh, observe something and then visually represent it. So I was talking about my skills that I built. And I talked all about color. I love color, 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 color relationships and um, painting flesh and, um, and, yeah. So I had all these answers that just described on the surface what what it was in the paintings I enjoyed. And he said, no, why, why the figure, though? What are you conveying with the figure? And it took a while. It took a whole semester. But I, I, I was able to articulate a little bit early on in the, in the fourth week, I think it was. 
I remember it pretty clearly, and I, and I realized it was the presence of the person that I really enjoyed. That's, that, was what, that is what I wanted to articulate with my figurative paintings. And so how, how does one build that then? And so I went back to those artists that brought me into the studio in the first place, Alice Neal. And she's an artist who has a, a, a heck of a life um, and had many adversities. And she was a portrait painter who worked from life. And people would be painted by her, and, and, and they weren't, they're not really flattering images of them. They, they, they tend to look a little torqued. And, and she was able to transform her energy by capturing her subjects and, and getting after those emotional in, um, intensities. And then the other artist I showed you already, Alberto Giacometti. And I, and I didn't know anything about him at the time, so I started looking him up, and, I, and it, it started to make sense. He, he had um, why I liked him so much. Um, Giacometti struggled with existence and, and questioned what is our existence? Um, what is our, our physical existence? What is our, um, is there a spiritual body? Um, and he's an existentialist. And while I don't share uh, some of the same um, beliefs, I, I, do, I do fall in the same conversation and found myself really wondering, what is our, can I really show one's presence? And can I speak of, what does that look like? And, and could I speak of a spiritual body? Um, so Albert Schurk-Dokometti, his, his figures are elongated, they're distorted a little bit. They move in and out of the picture frame and, and they become united and, and they coalesce into this environment that um, is on the surface. And I enjoyed that about his work. So in the studio, I, I, had, I, I made a shift. I, I recognized that the figure was important to me, but not only was it important to me, it was a thing that brought me in the studio and would hold my attention. And so I decided to work from life. And so I, I took a look at those superficial things that I was interested in and my, 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 ans my initial question, answers sorry, to uh, my professor, and one of them was, oh, I just love color, love color, color, color. And I, um, and I, uh, I decided I'm going to limit my palette. And I was encouraged to do that and try to get after maybe the presence through getting after a grander gesture of the body. And so this is from my junior and uh, senior year. I find myself um, watching the body's movements and, and that paint that I was so infatuated with and so in love with. I was able to let go of it and start dealing with the content itself and made these works where I just called them works. They weren't paintings, they weren't drawings, they were just works. And, and movement and gesture became insignificant to the, uh, the, the work itself um, and, and the record that accumulated on the surface. I decided, I gave myself some rules. I decided I, I wouldn't do any preliminary thumbnail sketches, that I would just make a panel, determine the size, and then just make it. And so even on this image right here, there's actually thumbnails because I didn't like my rule. So I, I, I allowed the surface to be a place where it became about this accumulation of marks. And at the very end of school, I realized that um, I, I got some questions about why is gesture so important? And, and it was a hard question to answer. Well, maybe it was about the presence and the movement. And then I realized and was honest with myself, and I finally got the courage to articulate to my Peers and my professor first, but um, I, I saw a connection with my childhood and the way I learned language. Um, so, so in, in learning language, it was it was quite difficult for me. I ended up having um, speech problems and um, auditory difficulties, and so following conversations was very challenging, and um, was it took a while. To, to learn how to communicate. So I heavily relied on body language, my presence with someone else, and watched and observed their movements and learned how to read people and how to depend on that while the language came to peace came together. Now, I graduated from Messiah College. I had a nice body of work. I felt confident, it felt good, but there were still some things that were unresolved. It's, it's not like when you graduate, everything comes together magically. Um, there's still questions that emerge. And one of the things that I, 
that stood out to me in my undergrad was um, some poetry and some writings on um, about um, time and about uh, and about our existence, possibly a spiritual existence. Um, and one of the poets that really stuck out to me was T.S. Eliot, and I want to read you a little bit about this. Um, Time present and time past, or perhaps present and time future. And if time future contain time past, if, all ter if time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What might have been is an abstraction, remaining a perceptual possibility, only in a world of speculation. What might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present. And he goes on a little later and says, at the still point. It's really interesting. At the still point of a turning world, neither flesh nor fleshless. Neither from nor towards, at the still point, there is a dance. There the dance is, sorry. But neither rest nor movement, and do not call it fixativity. Where past and future are gathered, neither movement from nor towards, neither ascend nor decline, except at the still point, the still point. There would be no dance, there is only the dance. And I cannot say there we have been, but I can only say where. And I cannot say how long, for that is a place it in time. A still point. I was after a still point. I was thinking about presence of the body. What is it exactly? Could I, I realized that I, I was after, after making this body work, I was really after trying to find, um, record a spiritual presence of the body, but using the corporeal form. And, and, and it was a little unresolved. And I want to encourage you is when, when you go through your classes, when you go through life, um, you get influences and you don't know necessarily what to do with them, but they're important. I'm still trying to figure out what the still point is. So I took this poetry with me. I took other um, literature readings that was important to me. And I left, I left undergrad and I kind of divorced myself from painting. I didn't know really where to go next. I was interested in making a painting that encapsulated an experience that could cultivate experience from another person um, and myself as a maker. And so I find myself, um, it, it was a subtle, I guess, divorcing of a painting. Um, I found myself falling in love with sculpture. Um, has anyone heard of Dia Beacon in New York? It's an old Nabisco factory that houses a bunch of um, installed artwork that's permanently there. And one of the artists at Dia Beacon was Richard Serra. This is a good example of his work. It's a tilted arch. And this is uh, located in the Federal Plaza, which, um, as you can see right here, is a, a place where people come and they congregate and they just relax. And oddly enough, this commissioned piece is right in front of the Federal Building, um, which houses uh, the Immigration Office. So ironically enough, um, we have this steel wall that, um, which actually is now taken down, um, that's inhibiting people to walk around and um, and causing a problem. Um, and and it was it was it was very controversial. People didn't like living with this work. Um, it was it was weird to walk actually around. No one would get really up close to the to the steel form. And so I start wanting to to bring to my paintings. Um, I, I want to bring to my paintings um, a sense that they only work, they only are successful if, if it engages a viewer and requires their presence. Another artist I looked at was Rachel White Reed, and this is another good example of her, uh, good example of work, at this house from 1993. And Rachel Wright Reed, she's actually transforming the spaces we dwell in and the objects that we live around. So she typically casts objects from domestic environments and heightens our awareness of negative space. And I just love the fact that she was talking about those things that are some, just so overlooked, like how I want to talk about those intangible aspects of our being. Another view of her work. And the, th the, thing that, the, the thing that ran throughout all the work, the sculpture work that I was looking at, is it really required our participation. And it had us challenge our own presence, interaction. So in my studio, after undergrad, I had a, I was, um, I had a studio for three years. And 
It took six months to make it work, and I was much quicker than that before. And I found that there was some transformation that happened. I would like to show you those transformations. First, a figure dissolved into the environment, so I stopped rendering the likeness, and I gave that up. And what I found is I started getting after a different kind of presence. They became silhouetted forms. And I became even more so aware of mapping the movements, really um, practicing um, watching one's body movements. And I found that the, the figure in the ground started to have this interconnected relationship. And I, I, I found the figure itself almost secondary, oddly enough, that I cared more about the environments, the spaces. So after three years of working in a studio, I was about ready to um, go back into a body of people I can work with. And so if I found myself at the University of Connecticut. And then in grad school, I felt like I had an insufficient knowledge of painting, which probably wasn't so, but it was just that my love was really with sculpture. Um, and I took this, um, I took with me um, this, this deep sense of wanting to express as, um, us as spiritual beings. And so again, I find myself in the studio getting questions I can't answer. Um, and, and I was asked, if you want to show the presence of a person, I was challenged, why not observe yourself? And I'm like, okay, I can, I can get a mirror. I can, I can work for myself. That's, that's fine. I go, no, 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 no. Why not observe your own presence? I had no idea what that meant. Um, and then I was encouraged, the other thing that stuck out is play. They asked me, are, are you having fun with these? I'm like, oh, yeah, I make my work. It's work. No, are you having, are you having fun with them? Are you playing? I'm like, fun is not for the studio. So I found myself challenging the anchor, the thing that brought me into the studio, and I started to observe myself, I'm not really sure what that would be. And then there was a shift in the practice, and I decided I was going to allow myself to maybe play and do things that I had no idea, didn't know the outcomes for. And so, so um, in this new territory, I find myself covering, this is very early into grad school, covering the entire wall, which was 90 inches tall, uh, with paper and taping it together, seaming it together from behind. And I find myself making these frenetic marks on the surface and not really sure what I'm doing. First, I took a mirror and I drew for myself and playing. And I divorced myself from the medium and, and said, I'm just going to draw for a while and have it be more immediate. And so I find is that the scale was, was important. I was able to have a surface that consumed my presence, my bodily dimensions. And then I took work and I hung paper on the wall going out onto the floor. And I got quite dirty. I took powdered charcoal and I moved around and thought, well, maybe if I'm talking about my presence, maybe it's visceral. Maybe it's about me putting my mark on the surface. And so on this piece right here, I'm actually lying down on a piece of paper, drawing my surface, still not really sure what it is, what this territory I'm trampling on is. And I move out of drawing and I move into another medium, into photography thinking about residue. Could I make work that, that shows my physical residue? So I start recording my body moving in space um, and get these, these moments that have fixed moments, uh, which compresses time into a single object. And I like in this work, uh, it has some kind of ephemeral um, residue on it. That pink thing is uh, a flip-flop, actually, a pink flip-flop I had. And then it has this um, tape on the wall. And I don't think it's, you can't really see it on a slide here, but there's this fixed moment on the, you can see the tape and you can see the crinkle on the tape against this, um, this very ephemeral um, burst of kind of energy thing going on the bottom. And I like that duality. So taking looking at other um, artists was important at this time. I, I, I shifted my attention to sculpture onto performance art, um, work that required bodies, uh, one's own presence to make the work complete. And wondering, should I, should I dabble with this? Or sh I need to consider it at least. 
And so I took a look at one artist, Robert Morris, and, and he does a blind time series where he's using charcoal and, uh, and timing himself, time is important, and viscerally making marks on the surface using his hands. So I identified that as something important. So taking scale four, which this work is behind us right here, um, I gave myself a place to really think and operate. And I start making a work and um, organizing the paper, formally um, putting things down, um, a little bit overthinking. And then in the time itself, I found myself emptying my mind and um, taking that anxiety and start making something that I didn't even think of. And so I'm actually painting here with my hands and visually making the marks. And I end up with um, uh, something that I couldn't even imagine or preconceived. And so space becomes important, environment becomes, addressing the environment in these, uh, in these works become important. Um, I'm interested in um, how the work comes together as a whole, but how all those little tiny parts add up. And I start recognizing that this is important, an important aspect of the work. So every smudge and drag makes a success of the work. And I acknowledge in some of these works, uh, which this work is very different than what we're seeing in the, in the room here, maybe close to the work on this wall over here, there's a lot of open and empty space. And so the negative space becomes more important to me than the positive space itself, the positive space being that mark which I make. And at this point, I start pulling away and, and not relying necessarily on my touch. Um, making it with my hand, and I start to have arm extensions and start painting with brooms and interested in that space that exists between me and the paper and the proximity I get to the work. It's a detail of that. So the scale is still important. I find myself wanting to focus on one part of the painting. As you see this from the work, well, you can't see the work from behind, but I showed you before, there was these two kind of forces evolving on the picture plane. And I really just wanted to see if I can have one form evolve. And I found is that these forms start to act as bodies. I, I call them bodies, um, maybe because I'm a, um, rooted in figures so much, but I see them as units, uh, this, this, this thing that evolves on the surface um, that has a hulkish like, this one has a hulkish like presence to it. So I start naming around this time my pieces with time stamps. So I, I, I label it when I start the work and when I finish the work. And I start to realize that time is really important to this piece. That if I'm going to experience my present, it's going to be about that actual physical time I spend making it. And I'm interested in, in the line that's created, that residue of inf information that's created when the particles fall onto the bottom edge of the paper, creating like a timeline. So, and how at the same time, in the same picture, the works can be interwoven, the marks can be interwoven where you can't really retrace the steps. And that became an important key thing in my work is that I want to make something that can't be recreated. It's something I couldn't just simply go up there and make, um, but uh, I even forgot the process of how that image evolved. And so a lot of these images, there's something else um, formally constructing the image. And I think this is a good time to note um, there's, a, there's a, clear, a clear similarity between the work that was evolving in my studio and the abstract expressionist movement and action painting. Does anyone know of, um, does anyone know of uh, Pollock, Jackson Pollock? Who here knows of Jackson Pollock? So ja Jackson Pollock, um, I, 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 did, I, I came making this work looking at performance artists, looking at Carolee Scheman and um, sculpture, and not really looking at painting and having that um, in my eye sight. And, and I found myself looking and being intrigued that, oh my goodness, I'm making something that has so much commonality, but I'm coming at it from a different angle. Um, 
And what I, while the work is not made derivative from it, there's a lot of commonalities in which Jackson Pollock pours his paint. And within those marks, that his gesture is embodied and his layers get so interwoven. Um, that was something I found interesting. And I recognize I found interesting in my work and I really found interesting in his work in particular and took that forward into work. And so sometimes you make stuff and you don't know what you're making and all of a sudden you realize, wait, someone made something very similar to this. Um, and so, so I had to deal with that in grad school. Uh, and it was a great discovery. Uh, the, th the thing I loved about, uh, the, the thing that is most significant to, to that experience of, which is still continuing, of looking at a movement that I, I have a connection to is realizing those similarities. And so work like Ad Reinhardt and Jackson Pollock, they just, they just don't look the same on a screen as they do in person. Has anyone seen a Jackson Pollock in person? Okay, they're, they're intense. You can't, you can't focus on one certain thing. There's so many things and it consumes your peripheral and your environment. And, it, it, and for me, when I experience Jackson Pollock's work, or I hope it even my work, so it, there's a place for me to project my own body and presence. So here I want to show you a couple images of work that I, I, I realize that, that, that they have these bodies and I'm trying to, these forms that are evolving. And I, and I call them bodies because I take, uh, if you can see in the gallery, there's, there's three dimensions of paper. There's three different sizes. And, they're, um, and the, the, the longer pieces are referencing almost a door frame, a space where your body, my body's reach could, um, could reach and fit within. And so I make works where I try to move outside of that perimeter, to move outside the edges, to reach something else, and have a space where the marks are moving, into the, moving in and out at the same time and around. And I find that they start looking like weather patterns almost. And so as much as I like my work, something happened um, in the past, um, Three years. I have a photographer at Kansas State who takes my photographs. I, I don't know how to shoot my work. Um, uh, and uh, I have this wonderful photographer who is photographing my work. And I asked him to give me some details. And I find myself, while I like the work itself, is being really interested in what's happening in those details. In those segments when you just cut down and look at a, a little tiny part. And I start wondering, and it was slow, how can I really make a painting where I enter into that surface like I am um, into to the details? How could I actually make it work? Do I, do I cut it? Do I crop it? And I didn't really want to do that. I, I, I want to stay faithful to the piece of paper that um, acting as a record and show the audience everything I made, every mark. And so I have some works where they're not as laborsome. They have, they have some open space, some breadth to them. But I still have an area where it gets back and, and compact and congested. So one of those steps I took in figuring out that I, I, you know, I, I do like my work, but what is about these details? And trying to question that, I thought about scale of the, of the, of the brush, of the, the tool that was implementing and making the, the mark itself. And so I switch that up and I start painting with brooms and start painting with um, sheets of plastic and I use the edge and have squeegees. And then I get even closer, trying to get even closer into these surfaces, having a grand gesture consume the space that the work is in. But even then with this work even here that we're looking at, I'm still really interested in those details, which brings me to the work on the larger paper on the walls over here. And here, in this, this newer work, I'm trying to step with, have the audience be able to step within side the frame, inside these, these funnel-like forms, and, and to not give them a place where they can rest their eye. I want to read for you a quote here from, um, an artist, um, a musician, John Cage. Does anyone know who John Cage is? John Cage here describes um, his work um, and, how, um, and how that evolves. 
says, I've always tried to move a from, sorry, I've always tried to move away from music as an object. Moving towards music as a process, which is without a beginning, middle, or end. So instead of being like a table or a chair, the music becomes like weather. And so in these works, I'm trying to get into the environment, create an environment that it doesn't really matter where the eye falls, that you can be within this um, and and the time and past and future, that there, there is no beginning, there is no end. Um, it's all one and the same. And, and by experiencing these works, you're completing the works. And I want to read you one more uh, quote. And it's, it's, it's someone talking about John Ashbery, who's a, a poet. And it says, John Ashbery compares his poems to environments. The idea, getting, the idea beginning that an environment is something that you are immersed in, but can't possibly be conscious of the whole. They are akin to a sense to environmental art, where, he has, where, he, where, as he puts it, you're surrounded by a different element of work, and it doesn't really matter whether you're focusing on them or none of them at any particular moment, but you're kind of getting this indirect refraction from the situation you're in. And so while I still like the details within my work, I'm satisfied by this overall experience as a maker. And I find myself not being able to really be able to separate myself at this point from what I call the bodies that are forming, because they kind of reference the scale and the height of a body, and it becomes this object. Um, but I start to chip it away, and, and I find that these details of the work more interesting than, than the, the figure itself sometimes, and I go back and forth with my likes and dislikes for it. So this summer, I made some works. They're still very new. Um, so I'm not really sure what to say about them yet. Um, here, I, I guess I could tell you what I was thinking about. Um, here, I, I have a motion. I try to start wrapping it, using the paint, like wrap, shrink wrapping the object, containing it, but allowing it to expand at the same time. And this summer, I came up with all, uh, I make my own, uh, I came up with these all beautiful segmented details of the work, switching my tools dramatically of how I make. Um, and, and I found myself wanting to slow down quite a bit. Um, slow down quite a bit and, and take a look deeper inside of the works. Um, and, and while I find the work satisfying, I, I just want to pause and partake in a meditative process. And while, and while these images do create that meditative process, I'm constantly looking for a moment where it comes together and I couldn't plan it. And it becomes exhausting. So most recently in my studio, I've, um, the, this, these are just the four last works I showed you are four of the um, about 15 works I've done in my studio. So there's tons of stuff waiting for me in my studio back at Kansas State that I'm working on um, and need to complete. Um, that it, it's, it's, not, it's not a stopping point. It's the, thing that, it's the thing that could inhibit you or give you the strength to keep on moving and make the work. So I'd just like to end with that um, I read that poem to you from T.S. Eliot, and it's something I encountered in my undergrad experience, right when you guys are about in your studies. And I didn't understand it fully, and the, the thing is, I'm not sure if I still understand it. He talked about a still point of a turning world, a still point where time all collects, and I'm still looking for that still point. And that's a part of the work, is, is that continual process of pushing forward um, that makes the work exciting not having all the answers and going to the studio um, and resolving the work before you even started it. Thank you.
Yes, so that, um, that when I look at those details, I, I, I have never tried to recreate it in a large scale, but maybe um, this is my attempt right here. Or wait, I'll get to it. <laughs> maybe I won't. Or here. So I, tr I do try to recreate it, but the thing is I'm not Instead of trying to recreate it, I examine what are the factors I like about those details and analyze that. So taking a little look at it, it's when those interaction of marks come together is when I find, um, when the marks become interwoven surfaces, that's what I'm really interested in. Um, and so I change up my tools. Um, so that's how I've um, moved closer to the work. Yes? Uh, yeah, I noticed uh, on most of your works, uh, just explore a limited color palette? Yeah. Have you considered using other colors? Yeah, that, that's a great, that's, that's a big question, but, <laughs> well, <laughs> I think it's coming, but it's not here. Um, but what, I, what I'd like to pose is that there is co there subtlety within um, warm and warm and cool tones, and I play with those relationships. Uh, but when it comes to color, I, I'd like to have a lot of, when I, when I use color, I want to use control. And that's, that's not um, an element I want to bring to my work right now of having that much control. So um, I, I guess it'll happen, I think. But I, I haven't figured out how that's going to happen yet. It's a really good question. Any other questions? Yes. What's your immediate plan since you're not maybe doing color? What are you going to stick with a particular pattern? Why doing that with your rooms and your Yeah, yeah. So um, I hate when people do this. They, they talk about a particular piece of work, but they won't show it to you. Um, so I, I didn't like, I, I didn't put in here like the new works and our products, but can I describe them to you? Um, I actually have been working on works on uh, synthetic paper, like over here on the wall, where it's a square 60 inches by 60 inches, and I flood the paper with uh, paint that I make. Um, and I start mopping around the surface, and I cover that whole surface. So you can think about it being a white surface, and I put a black paint on it. And I control, the, um, I control every aspect of paint, because I use five different binders. And so it has this paint, this one piece has texture to it. And I find myself drawing on time it, on top of it, but consuming the whole surface, putting a very, um, pretty much the same mark all over, and creating a very unanimous surface. That there is no focal point. And I found myself with these works. I go back and forth in this process, and then slowly I start to make a mark that's maybe a little bit more discernible. Um, um, and 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 I, I'm treating them like the, this goes back to the, I'm treating them like the details in a sense, by really dramatically change, changing the, the, brew, you know, the size of, of the material I'm using, using um, different tools. But then what I'm, going, what I'm doing now is I'm stopping and I'm, I'm like making a line that incises a surface and, and making these wave-like patterns. Uh, one line follows the other line. Um, so that's, that's what I'm currently working on. I, I don't know, I, I hope I didn't lose your question there. Yeah, the, the work is anxiety producing um, at times. And uh, they do pull together and embody these kind of emotions to it. But it's not like I think, OK, I'm going to make this one. This one's going to deal with 
melancholy. This one's going to deal with what, you know, whatever emotion. It's, it, it's more of how it comes to, it, it naturally evolves, intuitively evolves. Um, it's not premeditative, yeah. And, and is it cathartic? Do you, do you um, is, is it a way of like making demons tangible, right? We can, we can put them outside and, and look at them and explore them and pick them up and turn them around and look at different, different aspects of, of those things or, I don't, I don't know, it's not really I do, uh, yeah. They do become um, uh, forms and embody a nature. One of the first, uh, one of the first works I made in grad school, I actually showed to you, and I, uh, my faculty um, committee had referred to it as a Hulk, a Hulkish like form. I think that's the word they had used, but they do kind of gain their own kind of personalities and uh, um, nature to them. <coughs> yeah. Any more questions for Erin today? It seems like you're using dry media and wet media. Do you have a specific process? Do you put the dry media on first and then the wet media or go back and forth? Or is it different for every piece? Um, it goes back and forth. Um, it's, it definitely goes back and forth quite a bit. Um, there's actually a, a show I had done at Syracuse University. Uh, it was titled, I think, One Week in November. And every day I did a new piece. That was like the worst week ever. I absolutely hated every moment of it. It was, terif it was terrible. I mean, the work was fine. It was good. But I, you know, whatever. It was, but it felt incomplete to me. That was the point. And so I was dealing with issues of the, the labor of, of actually making the work. Um, and that was hard to be able to stop. So yeah, um, the works that I wanted to show you today are probably actually finished, but it takes me a while to figure out when something is complete. It so I would say works, it takes six months to kind of wrestle and s say, okay, it's really done. Um, <laughs> um, and I used to use a bracket of the, the starting time and the end time, and now I just, have left it to the being a starting time because I, I really want the viewer to complete the piece. That it's, it's something that I give them environment to, to be with and that um, it, it requires that participation uh, to be successful. So, yes. I can tell you when I started the work. So I did put, um, I, I knew I wanted to show you the, the work behind the, the screen right here. I knew I wanted to talk about that um, when Jim asked me to come out here, I was like, oh, I'll definitely show the older, at least this piece of the older work at the time. Um, so I decided to include that to the show. Um, but I think these are, I don't know. They take a long time to make. Um, but, but it doesn't take a long time to apply the material. If that makes, it, they take a long time, to, the drying and in between and the sitting. And that's all important to the making of the work itself.